I have to be very guarded when I give instruction to to give it in the role I'm playing. If I'm a, if I'm a mech one today, then I give instruction as a mech one. Uh, if there's something that needs to come top down, I will disengage, go talk to that appropriate supervisor, and then come down. I'd like to tell you I knew that from day one, but but there's there's something that that's called a chef said, which we have outlawed in this company. Because it was well, chef said we got to go do this, and, and it's the whole thing. It's the whole joke of when the general walks down the hall and says he likes the color blue, and then the lieutenant colonel tells everybody the general wants the house the house painted blue. So it, it's I have I have to be very guarded against doing. Welcome to Grow Think Tank. This is the one and only place where you will get insight from the founders and the CEOs of the fastest growing privately held companies. I am the host. My name is Gene Hammett. I help leaders and their teams navigate the defining moments of their growth. Are you ready to grow? But how do you as a leader inspire trust across all levels of the company? You know it's important to um, have those people trust you as a leader, but it's also important for you to trust them. And so what are the mechanisms that you use to make sure that you have a culture of trust? Well, that's the core of today's conversation, inspiring trust across all levels of the company. We have a special guest today. His name is Chef. His real name uh, or given name is James Barlow. He is the founder of Blue Air Training. They are a really unique uh, kind of training organization uh, that prepares people and actually flies airplanes weaponized for the Air Force. Uh, It really is an exciting kind of conversation to have about some of the work that they do. But even more important to you is how do you inspire trust? Inspiring trust as a leader is something that you should be thinking about probably more than you do because trust is such a critical element to the success of the organization. Do people feel heard? Do they feel valued, appreciated? Do they respect you as a leader? All of those things are unpacked inside this episode. We go through some of the details of, you know, what is the difference between micromanaging and actually you know, leading people to the next level? Well, we look at that today with Chef. Now, if you haven't already downloaded the training that is about you becoming a better leader and leading a group of A players, make sure you go to genehammett.com forward slash training. Inside that, you will see the three mistakes that are most often come up inside of growing companies as it relates to leadership, and you can actually fix them. We give you everything we can inside that short training. Just go to genehammett.com forward slash training. Here's the interview with Chef. Hey, Chef, how are you? Good, good. How are you? Thanks, Gene, for having me. Fantastic. Well, this podcast is all about leadership and culture of fast growth companies. Um, Blue Air Training has been uh, growing really fast over the last few years. Tell us a little bit about what you do. So Blue Air Training is the first ever civilian-owned weaponized Air Force to fly missions for the actual U.S. Air Force. So when you are scheduling air forces, the blue air is the good guys and the red air is the bad guys. So we've all seen a movie where uh, the army gets in a gunfight. There's a guy on the ground that gets on the radio and talks to airplanes. And then the air force comes in, drops bombs and saves the day. We train the guy on the ground on how to properly talk to a fighter aircraft um, to get bombs on the ground in close proximity to friendlies to do close air support. You know, that sounds like something that shouldn't be possible. <laughs> it's and I'm not, sure you're it's told illegal. That. It's absolutely illegal. It is illegal to arm with live weapons a civilian owned airplane, except um, and if you are an ATF uh, arms manufacturer, which we are, uh, and then you have to be inspected and actually brought onto a governmental status um, by the Air Force, Army, or Navy. So, so they actually, uh, we report. Uh, with our airplanes to the Air Force for airworthiness and not the FAA. So the aircraft, although civilian owned, operate in a governmental status. Now, I will go ahead and say this. I've never had to, to do this, but your <laughs> your call sign is Chef. Your real name is James Barlow. Yes. Um, just give us a brief reason why I'm going to be calling you Chef throughout this episode. So, so um, one, because normally only my mom and my wife call me James anymore. But uh, um, so when you're, you know, on the eve of Top Gun 2 coming out, uh, you know, everyone 
throws the Maverick and the Iceman around, but, but really fighter pilots do go by call signs. So you spend three years becoming combat mission ready in a fighter squadron. And then when you're ready, they kick you out of the squadron bar and everyone tells all the funny stories that you've accumulated over the last three years. And then they come up with a name that, that suits you. And that's your name, period. You don't go by James. Matter of fact, we, we used to have first name Fridays and no one could remember anyone's first name. So we went back to call signs. So rather than being a cook, I supposedly always had something cooking. So chef stuff. Well, now you know why I'm calling him chef and what that means. So I want to dive into our episode today. You know, I study fast growth companies. Uh, Blue Air Training has not made the list once, but um, three times by my count and continuing to, to, to get some good numbers. It's hard to keep, uh, keep the pace of 106 in 2017. Um, what, what, what do you learn about growing and leading a fast growth company? So in 2017, we were 106, then 504, then 743, and not yet released, but we've made the list again this year. Um, but even in 2017, I said, my goal, I would like to be 49.99 because the faster you're having to run, it's often at the expense of efficiency, it's often at the expense of, of being able to have the, the time and the patience to you know, methodically set up your structure and, and be able to structure for a fast business. Um, and a lot of times you're just running to try to keep up. So, so fast is often applauded, but uh, um, is not always the most comfortable as a business owner. So I think a lot of people tune in today because one of the reasons that makes this podcast different, and unique from others is we're not just talking about business. We're not just talking about, you know, you know, what can we do to grow? But I'm, I'm talking with founders, just like yourself, co-founders, CEOs that have, you know, grown fast growth companies, but also doing it from a perspective that is what I've learned from it is really different. It's not just a hard driving numbers game. It's really about the people. Right. Would you tell us a little bit more about why it's so much about the people growing a fast growth company? It's, it's absolutely about the people. Uh, it's, it's more, and we're in a very equipment heavy, um, you know, uh, we're in a very equipment heavy industry. Um, if we were a country, we would rank number 19 amongst the 138 air forces of the world per global firepower in the attack aircraft category. So we've got tactical data link, machine guns, we buy bombs from the same factories that make them for the Air Force, but all that runs on people because I can put the best airplane in the field that money can buy, but if I don't have the right voice on the radio and if, and if he's not doing the, the correct tactics or, or the coordination isn't right or the logistics isn't right or the maintenance for some reason, something is wired wrong, none of it happens. So it's completely about the people. Now, it's really easy to say it's all about the people, um, but I think what's hard is to define what are the core elements that, that help you as a leader align this. And I know my team has worked with you to figure out um, the importance of trust and respect inside of the company. Uh, tell us why those are so important to employees and, and your business. Well, especially for our business. We, we fly um, three to five one week long training exercises across the country in a different place every week, 48 weeks out of the year. So, so we've got these aircraft loaded up with live weapons, million dollar sensors on the wings, and I don't see them. They're, they're out at Fort Benning, they're, they're in North Carolina, they're in um, you know, New Mexico. Or, and so we, we have something that we borrowed from the Air Force called a detachment commander. And that person's in charge. So I give my strategic vision on how things are supposed to go. The next, the vice president level is the next level down and each one in their area um, defines what the guidelines, you know, between 10, you know, stay between 10 and two o'clock. And then that person is empowered with their own maintenance team, their own bomb loaders, their own aircraft, and they coordinate directly with the client to set up the exercise and they go. I don't know when they're flying, who they're talking to or what they're doing until they're already back. And, and a lot of times based on those levels, I don't hear about it until it's a quarterly summary. So, now, Chef, so you have to be able to trust them. Let me break in here for a second. If you happen to be listening to this on YouTube, make sure you go ahead and hit the thumbs up. If you like this content, we want to create more just for you so that you can be a stronger, more effective leader. 
If you want to subscribe to make sure you don't miss an episode, that'd be fantastic. And if you want to hit the bell notification button to be notified the next time we post content, then do that as well. I look forward to helping you be a stronger leader, be more visionary, and be more effective in leading growth across your company. I know that you have about 60 plus employees. Is that about right? 66? Uh, 67. So um, it, it doesn't happen like that overnight. Let's go back in the journey of this. Like, were you always able to empower the people when you first started hiring the first set of people or when you, you, you bring on new people into the team? Or is it something you've learned in this journey of leadership? Well, I, I will share with you. So we were, so we, we kicked this off with, you know, two men in a truck, basically. I did my, I actually did my aircraft mechanic training. So I was the director of maintenance. I was the lead bomb loader. I would, you know, uh, tool Haynes was, was, you know, several, several things. We had another guy who was not here, who was still not with the company, um, who was the chief pilot at the time. And um, we actually, we're at the 30 personnel neighborhood and that for years and we grew very fast and we were up over a hundred and now we're back down to 67 um, to get to the point of why the, why the, the number, because the, the flying workload, we've had hundred percent market share for the air force for five years now, um, which the flying load has been about even, but when, when you're growing so fast, Hey, I need somebody for this. I need somebody for this. I need some, and and that fast growth is often at the expense of efficiency. And uh, another aspect of that is is it's often or sometimes Mr. Right now versus Mr. Right. So, um, hey, I need somebody to do this job. You're available. You'll do it. Go. Um, and and so you'll you'll have some personnel turnover as that's as that's all going because. You need somebody in that seat, and then as time goes by, sometimes quickly, sometimes not quickly, people will self-identify that they're either above their head or just not able to continue at that pace. When you think about engaging your next level of leaders that are merging inside your company, how do you teach them the importance of trust and respect across the organization? For, for me and for Blue Air and for my experience um, is, is counter to the Air Force um, because you go to squadron officer school, Air Command and Staff College, and you have that very structured leadership training. But uh, so what was different because we're 87% military and everyone's used to that previous model is it's important to engage at all levels. And everyone can say, oh yeah, I walk the floor and I say, hello, well, guess what? Anybody can stand on their head while the CEO walks across the floor. But I actually, you know, will go and engage and, and I like to, I, I, I strive to, to be a, a servant leader. Um, so if the floor needs mopping, I go mop the floor. And if the bathroom needs cleaning, my, my wife, Dr. Gretchen Barlow will go clean the bathroom sometimes, or if I'm not doing it, and I'll go work on airplanes and I'll, you know, I'm, I'm certified as a mech level, mechanic level one, and I will go and, and cut out a day to actually work with the people on the line. And that doesn't mean you're stepping over their leaderships, but it's, but it's actual engagement at all levels versus just, hey, how you doing? You got everything you need? Great. And then you walk out. Hold on for a second. Chef just said it's important to engage at all levels. Well, what does that mean? To me, it means you want to be in the trenches sometimes. You want to be on the front lines with your people. I had an interview with Frank Blake, one of the CEOs or former CEO of Home Depot, and he talked about the importance for him to put on an orange apron. If you've ever been there, you know what that means. And for him just to walk the floor and he would see things and, and be able to engage with people in such a unique way. In fact, none of the customers knew who he was because the, the CEOs of some of these big corporations are not famous, if you will, but Frank Blake understood the importance of being in the trenches. And I think that's exactly what uh, Chef is talking about today is engaging at all levels. It's not going and just saying, hey, how are you? And moving on with your day. It's really taking the time to connect with those people. Now, it gets harder as your team grows. So it's important to do it as your team is where it is today, because tomorrow, as you add one person or 10 people next year or whatever it may be, it gets harder and harder. Do it now to keep your finger on the pulse of the team.
back to the interview with Chef. Now, that is very different than what a lot of people do. And, it, and what you're describing there is it's not micromanagement, but I think some people can confuse that. Tell us a little bit about the, your perspective on micromanagement as your company has, has evolved. Right. I like to be micro-informed because part of the whole chefism, uh, and my wife jokes about this all the time, is, is like, I ha- like I like to work on three things at the same time. Like I've got, I've got different windows up on different browser types, and I will have three different things that I'm working on at the same time because it, for me, it keeps it fresh, 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 fresh. So, so I like to engage at all levels and I like to be micro-informed. I want to know that the, the forward hoist bolt on the PC9 wing is a 7 with a 20 thread. I like to know those things. I'm not going to be the guy that goes out and, and does that, but I like to feed my brain information. So that way when I'm, you know, when I'm working with the guys, I'm like, all right, you need a, you know, a 7 on that and, and away you go. I have to be very guarded when I give instruction to to give it in the role I'm playing. If I'm if I'm a mech one today, then I give instruction as a mech one. Uh, If there's something that needs to come top down, I will disengage, go talk to that appropriate supervisor, and then come down. I'd like to tell you I knew that from day one, but but there's there's something that that's called a chef said which we have outlawed in this company. Because it was, well, chef said we gotta go do this. And, and it's the whole thing, it's the whole joke of when the general walks down the hall and says he likes the color blue, and then the lieutenant colonel tells everybody the general wants the house, the house painted blue. So it, it's, I have, I have to be very guarded against doing that. Now, I gotta put a spotlight on that. You outlawed this, this saying, and I think it's because- yes. We're not allowed to say executive, and you're not allowed to say chef said. <laughs> say that again because maybe I was talking over you. Sorry, you're not allowed to say executive because that that to me and in, in our culture has a connotation of oh I'm a, I'm an executive that's beneath me and we don't play that. Uh, and and the 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 chef said to do this if it didn't come through a formal channel there you don't say well chef said and then go outside of your normal chain. I I really appreciate you going through that because I think a lot of leaders they still love the control. And it's, it's really interesting coming from a military background because military is built on life or death. Like it, there's, you know, people follow orders or people die. And that's not, that's more than just a movie quote, right? It's leadership inside of a corporate engagement is a little bit different. There's a lot more empowerment, I think, inside of, of your business. And is that correct, fair to say? Yes, and it, and it has to be. So, so you know, we've got 67 employees right now, but, but we've got three bases. So I've got full-time operations in Pensacola, Florida, Las Vegas, Nevada, and Yuma, Arizona, plus all of those hub, hub and spoke op- operations. So at any given time, I could be at eight different bases simultaneously. So, so it would be different if I could just walk out here and talk to 67 people, but that is not the case. So you have to you have to be regularly engaged, but with a vision and, and guidance specific enough to be executed, but not so specific that it doesn't give the employees enough latitude to make decisions. When you think about your the mistakes that you've made as a leader, walk us through something that has really defined your own version of leadership that you have today. I wish I could say that I wish I could come up with some like, oh, I'm too trusting or I'm too whatever, but but that's not the case. I've made several mistakes. Um, Some were my own and some were at the fault of of my fault because as a CEO, CEO, it doesn't have to be your fault to be your fault. So so it's your fault regardless. But to answer your question, the, the mistakes have been sometimes to be too trusting too early or to maybe you know, piggybacking on the statement I just said, you know, you have to give specific enough guidance. So maybe guidance was not too specific. And then, and then the, the third part of that is no one knows your business better than you as, as the founder, as the, the, the guy who's on the line working it every minute of every day. If your eyes are open, you're thinking about your business. No one knows it as, as well as you. So I've had to be guarded in, in making sure that I don't get frustrated when someone didn't see that second step before it happened, or someone didn't know that this other thing is going on over here when they're over there. Like, how could you not know that? Well, that's because they don't have the visibility. So, so 
communication laterally is just as important as communication up and down. When you think about, you know, the, the routines and the, the strategy you use to, to bind everybody together and to, to provide the connection necessary for a company to grow at the pace you have, um, what are some of the uncommon or counterintuitive strategies that you've looked to um, that make that possible? So I, I used to use a term, um, I still actually do this, but I just don't use the term, um, about, you know, I, I, I was a, you know, a single dad um, with, with two very young boys um, early in my 20s and, um, and with 100% um, custody. So I did, I raised them. They used to call me Mapa. So when, when, you're, when you're raising young kids, you know, one of the things you have the honor of doing is teach them how to ride a bike. And, and when you bring people into your company, it's like teaching them how to ride a bike. They've ridden bikes, but they haven't ridden this bike. So, so what I used to always say was, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you ride the bike and I'm going to hold on to the seat post. And just like with my sons, uh, who are now both in the Air Force, you, know, you, you start letting go of that seat post a little bit. And then before you know it, they turn around and they're doing it all by themselves. Um, and I had a, a Marine Lieutenant Colonel who I had said that, that phrase to, and, and he said he was offended. Well, you know, I'm sorry about your feelings, but guess what? This is not your company. It's, you're gonna be a, become a part of it, and we call it the Blue Air Family, but at the end of the day, it's my ass. So, um, so sure enough, that person was was hard to work with. They wanted to do their own way. They they actually, you know, drew, you know, created a wedge in the company. So to bring it all around, you know, as as the founder, you've got to you've got to come up with your vision, and you got to be able to package that and and impart that on all your employees top down. And you have to keep you have to trust, but also verify that they're executing that vision until you don't have to verify it anymore. Uh, Tool Hands, for example, I don't know what Tool Hands is doing today, but I guarantee it's in line with my vision, the company's mission, and he's probably think, fixing problems that I don't even know exist yet, because he's been here long enough, and we just we even fly the airplane the same techniques because we've worked so closely together for a long time. So as a founder and as as the the creative and as the visionary for a concept, whatever that might be being able to keep that fresh and vision alive with new people and have it cascade down to the lower levels is absolutely key. Now, Chef just said something really interesting in there. I don't know if you caught it, but it doesn't have to be your fault to be your fault. Well, that's a very complex way for people to understand that as a CEO, it's always your fault. There's no excuses for anyone else. If someone on your team isn't communicating effectively enough, it's your fault because you have not made that a priority. You have tolerated something else, something less than what's, what you expect. And you can't blame others for them you know, not showing up on time because all of the details behind where you are as a culture is because of you, the CEO. Now, the hard part behind this is how do you take ownership for the problems, but also give others a chance to take ownership for it too. Now that's you know the dichotomy of leadership that really is difficult to explain. But the most simple way I can do this is you want to make sure that you are giving them ownership, but at the end of the day, you still own it. Period. Now back to the interview with Chef. Now I want to put one final question in here. Uh, it wasn't planned, so I'm not trying to throw you a curveball, Chef, but it's really about vision. A lot yes. of companies will say, you know, we had a vision at once, but we're just so busy or we're trying to grow and we're just, we're just trying to focus on the work. And I have to always have the conversations about, you know, what vision is, why it's important, but you've mentioned it a number of times inside this interview. What is, what is the final words on why vision is so important for an organization of people growing fast? Right. So you have to, you have to trust since today's topic was trust and respect and you have to, and respect, respect earns respect up and down. So that's, that's the foundation that you build that trust on to be able to execute your vision. So you have to be able to explain why, not just what they're doing, but why they're doing it. And then you've got to trust that they're going to execute all those technical competencies, but to further the vision and mission of the actual company. Love it. Chef, thanks for being here on the podcast. 
Thank you so much. Great honor. I just love having conversations with leaders that are evolving and strong and clear in the vision that they have for the organization. And they're leading people the right way. Today, we had a chance to talk with Chef about what his vision for leadership is, how it's really impacted the growth of his company, and how you can do it too. If you're wondering about what your next steps are or what your next defining moment is as a leader, then make sure you think of me. I'd love to connect you with some of the frameworks and tools that I've used over the years to help leaders grow as leaders and create a more aligned team. I've got many specific tools that will help you be the leader that your people create. When you think of leadership, you think of growth, think of Growth Think Tank. As always, lead with courage. We'll see you next time.